Good evening, it's Annabelle here. Thank you for joining me for this evening's Working With Friends and Family. This is a welcome change from all the Brexit stuff we've been having, but frankly, I couldn't go on talking about Brexit anymore. I don't know about you. I may not have any friends and family left by the time we get to the end of Brexit. So our subject tonight is working with friends and family. I'm going to talk to you about this. And in a few minutes, I'm going to get back to you and see if you're with me on this. So how many of you are already working? with um family yeah you see me on the side good i'm getting there sorry about that you know i'm a bit slow on all these things so tell me now you're live in the room and i've tempted you in with my incompetence i know i'll come back because i can't see the slide i can't see the chat room um who's already working with family and if so who are you working with is it a husband a wife a partner a parent or your children if you are uh, working with friends and family or thinking about it, this is for you. And I have to tell you, after working with, um, starting a business with a dear friend, running a business with a husband, having my children involved in the business, working with my mother, um, yeah, it's not recommended, working with a friend but went sour. There are problems about this. And if you've done it and there are problems about it, I want to say it's not just you. I mean, I took the first few times it went wrong. It's a really personal failure. Like I was a really bad person. Um, the longer I've been in business and I'm celebrating my 39th year this year, the more I've realized this is the very heart of darkness because working with friends and uh, family and I want to give you some pointers tonight and talk to you about the issues so I am very much hoping now that we are sharing the right thing one of the things about getting started with involving people particularly people you know is figuring out who wants what particularly if you're going into a partnership with a friend in other words you're both going to run the same business um, things can very quickly go wrong and the problem with this is that we think because we're friends we know what the other one wants and how they operate but the truth is we might know that in a social setting but it's not at all the same thing when it comes to the world of work. So my big, big tip, and this applies, by the way, if you're taking on associates, employees, anybody, but doubly, doubly, doubly so if it's a friend, and more than that if it's a partner, is you need to have a plan. And you need to make your plan independent of your partner's plan. So you can go into separate rooms, separate bits of paper and write some stuff down. Because if those plans have absolutely nothing in common, it's probably not a good idea to risk the friendship or the family relationship by trying to make it work. I just want to say that one more time, because having a friend in business, having a family member is a bit like falling in love. That is just such a lovely feeling not to be on your own anymore that you forget that sometimes being on your own can be better if the relationship's going to go really wrong. So look at your plan for your business. What sorts of things might you or might not you have in common? Well, when I started my first business with a friend, it turned out that my plan was to try to make some money, to pay our creditors, and then if there was any money left over, to pay us equally. Does that sound like a reasonable plan to you? What happened, though, was that her plan was to make some money, take all the money until she didn't need any more. If there was any money left over, I could have some. And if there was any money left over after that, we could pay our creditors. So we didn't have an attitude to money in common for starters. The other thing we didn't have in common was the idea of how we were going to split up the work. The idea was, I thought, that we would split up the money equally and we would split up the work equally. But she had less time capacity than me for all sorts of family and domestic commitments. And so in her mind, she was going to put in less hours than me and she was going to make the same money. 
Now, we're in a fee earning business, so there's quite a direct correlation between how many hours you work and how much money you make as it was structured then. So, in effect, she was going to work part time for the same money as me full time. But in event, she wanted her money first. You can see how these things could lead to problems. But I never thought to discuss it. I assumed we were going to be partners, we were going to share the work equally, and we were going to share the money equally after we paid the people we owe money to. Similarly, you may find that although one partner can't put in as much time, they might want to put in money. And that obviously doesn't apply to staff and associates. So if one partner puts in a lot of money and one partner puts in a lot of time, how is that going to work? Are you going to have a notional salary for the partner who's putting in the time and then you split the profits 50-50? Or is the partner putting in the money saying, well, I work for that money, that was my time. Even though you're doing all the work, you couldn't do it if I didn't put the money in. So we're going to split the profits 50-50 anyway. Think about it. What often happens is we get started with friends and family because we like them and we just don't have these difficult conversations. So write down your business plan and get your prospective business partner, family member who's going to be an employee to do the same and see what you've got in common. If you can clarify areas of difference or things you haven't discussed or talk it out, that's great. But if you're not really having the same idea, I promise you, it will make your life so difficult and your relationship so difficult. You'll be sorry you've been born. Now, we've got a free uh, download available. You can get the, the last slide gives you where it's from, which will give you much more detail on that. But have a plan. If you're together about this, go ahead. And if you're not, just stop. People can support you in all sorts of ways, but making that level of commitment without something in common is a big mistake. It's a bit like a butcher and a vegan marrying and only finding out afterwards that that's the case. Sorting things out at an early stage is a great part of getting your ducks in a row, doubly so in its family. But you also have to plan for the end of this relationship. Now, your brother is always going to be your brother, and I've worked with mine. And your mother's always going to be your mother, and I've worked with mine. But they're not working with me today. My mother sadly has passed on, and my brother now lives in another country. So you have to have a plan for how this relationship's going to end. Too many business relationships anyway end because one person is deeply unhappy and decides to bring matters to a head. Either you're a boss firing someone or an employee resigning or you are an associate and you've all been there who simply declines to work for client again because you're not happy. And in partnerships, the not happy is usually massive rows. And I know it took me a lot of time and money to get rid of my first business partner. And the only people who made money from that was the lawyers. So the best time, you know this, to, to, to organize your breakup is when you're dating. So what do you want to own when this trading relationship with your family member or friend is ended? If you put in all the money, but you paid them to do the work, do you want to own the rights? Do you want to own the things they produce? What's the deal? Make this plan while you're still good friends at the beginning. Because if you can't agree it now, I absolutely promise you, you're not going to be able to agree it when you're arguing. You need to understand that whatever your expectations are, you need to be very clear because the law does not recognize friendship. I don't mean it doesn't know everyone has friends, but if, if you fall out with a friend and it goes really, really badly and they say, this is not what I signed up for and, and it goes to court or arbitration and somebody says, well, what was the deal? And you go, well, it wasn't necessary to have anything written down because we are friends. That's not going to help anything. It's going to make it a lot worse. If your friends are acting as employees, they have all the employment rights that go with that. 
if your friends are acting as subcontractors, they have all the copyright and IP that goes to that. And if they're acting as business partners in the absence of a company, you can be jointly and severally liable for what they decide to spend money on. That's a great way to ruin a friendship, isn't it? So these areas are really, really important for you to consider before you get going. Early friends and family we use in our startup business are often volunteers. Your sister takes care of the kids because you can't afford childcare because you're not making any money yet. Your mum helps out. Your brother gives it a go and we're all very happy. But that if you are starting to expect them to do things and depend on them to do things, they're not really volunteers. Take an attitude check for a moment. If you feel cross, if they're not doing what you think they should be doing, if they don't want to help you, they are not really volunteers, are they? If you have expectations of things being done regularly and for you, that's not volunteering. And be aware, by the way, that in this country, only charities can lawfully have free labour. So don't take the Michael with your family. Only do that with discretion. Now, when you first get going, it, everybody kind of helps out. But after a while, you need to start to structure your team. And you're going to find yourself needing people, firstly, with expertise that you don't have. Now, this could be an accountant or a web designer or somebody with techie skills. It wouldn't normally be doing the thing you want to do in business. If this is a friend, this can be a problem. If you're paying mates rates, i.e. cheaper rates than they normally charge in their business, you're going to get mates dates, by which I mean your work is going to be put on the back burner when there are more profitable clients work to be done so if, if you are working with someone who's doing something with you on a friendly basis you cannot expect them to meet your timetables if that is not acceptable to you you probably need to pay them properly now if you are paying them their normal rates and they're not meeting timetables then you need to get someone else who will now, it can be incredibly difficult, by the way, to get both accountants and web designers to meet your timetables, specifying what you want, when you want, and actually getting it is a mission in its own right. And I think I might do, never mind a webinar, but war and peace on that one of these days. But be aware of the fact that if your web designer is doing stuff for you as a mate, all the intellectual property and copyright in what they're doing remains with them unless they positively assign it to you. If they're doing it, as a subcontractor, there's a proper contract between you, it will do what the contract says. If you're using hours, it will assign to you when you pay. And accountants, well, I'd never use a friend as an accountant again, but I do know several people in business who have spouses who are accountants who do their books. I find that, I mean, each to their own a little bit intrusive. I wouldn't want my husband to know that much about my financial affairs. But I realise everybody's degree uh, expectations about marriage and privacy are different. The other reason why you might be taking on people in, in your business is for admin, bookkeepers, VAs, that sort of thing. I'm not talking now about if you are a VA and, and subcontracting to other ones, but if, you, if you're if getting in a muddle and someone in your family or friendship circle will say to you, I can do that, let me do it for you. Be careful to set this up properly with them, though, because once again, if you haven't set clear expectations about availability, when and how you're going to pay, who does what, it's a great way to ruin a friendship. And finally, your family can end up being associates, subcontractors and employees who actually deliver service. Now, all of these roles have pitfalls, and I want to tell you a story. The first... Uh, client I ever had, had a terrible, terrible problem with credit control. They had quite an established firm, quite a reasonable turnover for a tiny business, and they could never get the money in. And I went to talk to them and say, what's going on? What, why are you in such trouble? We always seem to be owed such a lot of money. And they went, that is because no, the guy in charge of credit control, Fred, is really bad at credit control. 
So I said, well, why is Fred in charge of credit control? They went, well, he's family and what can you do? So I went and had a long chat with Fred and I said to him, are you enjoying credit control? He went, no, everyone's always yelling at me. It's so stressful. We never have enough money in. And when I phone people up, they never want to take my call. I really wanted to be a graphic designer. I have no idea how I ended up with this role in the business. Nobody was happy. Fred wasn't happy. The business was struggling. In fact, it could have ended if someone didn't sort it out. And the customers weren't happy because when Fred did ring them up, because he didn't really want to ring them up, he made the call very unpleasant and that made them more determined to hang on to their money rather than less. So family-run businesses and friends-run businesses have a problem. And the problem is that in order not to upset your friend or family, you leave them doing jobs that you would never, ever, ever tolerate someone who wasn't a friend or family do. For the sake of your friendship, you need to come into the Google, what do I do about this? And start moving them either into roles they're good at or out of your business. If you think you're preserving a friendship by letting your friend consistently underperform in a role that they are rubbish at or preserving a family relationship by doing that, most of the time you are sadly, sadly mistaken. So how do you know when it's right is a very, very big question. Well, first of all, your family member or team member ideally should actually be good at the role you're putting them into. If they're not and you're taking them on as a trainee who knows nothing, that's another thing. But if you're looking to them as someone who's going to be able to function without you teaching them absolutely everything, they need to be good at it already. That means that they need to have had some training in it. Now, I have a cousin by marriage who did a graphic arts degree and in that she also did web design and she produces lovely, lovely web designs. But I wouldn't use her for my website because she's got no idea of data security and online shopping carts and that sort of thing. I have asked her from time to time to design pretty things for me and she does, but I have more sense than to put her in a role that she's not qualified for. And if you've ever done that, you will understand the pain that this can cause. Bear in mind that your friends and family have the same workers' rights as anyone else. And let's talk about this. We all know what running your own business looks like. All of us do it. At least most people who come to my webinars do. Most of us know what having a job is like. We don't live in a world where we've never, ever met anyone who's got a job. But most of us forget about workers' rights. You remember those workers. We talk about it in our customer group all the time in relation to IR35 and pay as you own, who are contracted to provide a service and cannot send a substitute. So if you insist that your sister, even though she's self-employed, is the only person who ever touches your books, you are moving her from a person who runs their own business to a worker, if that's how you set things up. Obviously, you can equally move them on to being a person who has the job if you insist on managing and controlling them as if they are an employee. The fact that your family makes no difference. Now, some of us encourage younger family members into our business as trainees, at least during holiday time. And this, too, can be contentious. The language we use can be misleading. An apprentice is someone who is on a recognised scheme that results in a recognised qualification at the end. There are lots of uh, MVQ schemes that result in uh, qualifications that are office-based apprentices for those of us in the service sector. But this involves going to someone who places apprentices and it involves having someone who will do day release at least at college. This is not just having a young worker and saying you're an apprentice. And those workers are entitled to a lot less than minimum wage. And they are very, very different from what the Americans call interns. 
Now, if your kids come to your business or your cousins and they hang out in the summer holidays or the Easter holidays, and I'm seeing a lot in offices as I go around at the moment, and they're not doing any work, obviously you're not expected to pay them. But if they are old enough to work and they are doing real work and you're not paying them anything at all, you may be in for a surprise because your kids do have the same legal right to be paid as anyone else. Now, I'm not saying the kids are going to sue you, but what you will find, and I found with mine, and I always paid mine at the very least minimum wage for their age group, was as soon as they could get more money, they went to work elsewhere, which was fine because I wasn't trying to groom them long term to stay in the business. Now, young workers do have a lower entitlement to wages than for the adult workers, but the apprentice rates only apply if they're on an apprentice scheme. So be careful if you're introducing young family members into the business because you're going to need to pay them the appropriate rates unless they're literally sitting around making coffee waiting for you to finish work or watching you work. Now, we do have rules in the UK. We have the national living wage. It's the equivalent of the USA minimum wage. I don't mean financially, but it's not just us who's got one. And there are international standards about minimum wage. So even if you're not based in the UK, there are a few countries where your kids can work a, a, a full time job for nothing just because your mum or dad or your brother or sister should do that. There are global rules about slavery, forced labour and trafficking. And much as it's good for our kids to help out and learn, making them work full time for nothing at all comes under the heading of forced labour and doesn't get you a lot of brownie points as a mum or dad. The other thing I'd like to nag you about, and you know I do, is GDPR. Just because they're family doesn't mean you're not obliged to properly contract them for secure data handling if that is what you are doing. It's lovely to trade on a handshake, but don't let your kids into your MailChimp list unless they have really, really, really had it properly explained to them and written down and they've signed something. For goodness sake, so much can go wrong in that area. Try to confine the, the, the family that you're kind of helping out over school holidays to areas less contentious than things that can go wrong with GDPR. Working with family can be really difficult and friends. The first thing you're going to need to do is to agree clear signals. When are you the boss and when are you mum or when are you their friend? It's so easy when it's your business, your baby, to mix all these things up. And I still get complaints today from husbands and kids. I'm actually doing a project for one of my son's role reversal. He's hired me as a consultant in the city firm that he's working in. And what he says to me at the weekends, I will talk about business. This is mum time. During the week, you can email me or talk about business. But occasionally we need to switch roles. So we've agreed quite clear signals like when I'm working for him in the city and he says to me, let's go out for coffee in that coffee time. We are mum and son. Unless he says to me in that coffee time, I need to talk to you about this privately because it's work related. We know where we are. I've learned to do that to stop people getting frustrated with. But but I, I wanted to have a friend's night out. I wanted to have a mum's night out or whatever. If you're going to keep friends and family working near you, have an agreed signal about when you're going to tick, talk about work and create a space for conversations about work. This can be useful, particularly if you're working at home. If you've got a home office, discourage people from coming into chat about non-work related things. But conversely, go out of the office to chat about non-work related things. Let them know you're available. If you are working in one space and not in another, it can be part of creating boundaries, psychological boundaries. You're never going to stop the family interrupting if you're home based, but you can vastly reduce it. My husband knows when I do webinars, the door is shut. He doesn't come in until I open the door. It's not because I don't love him. Obviously, I do. It's because, well, we once had a webinar when he walked in live to give me a cup of coffee on a very hot day and he didn't have a top on and everybody on the other end of the webinar thought he was naked which was charming but not the image I was trying to create. Create a space too for difficult conversations. 
from time to time you're going to have to say to your loved ones that's not it i wanted you to do this and not that do not do it over the family dinner table do not do it in places you normally have family or friendship based conversations if you normally go to coffee bar a because you're all friends and you must do this go to coffee bar b if you don't have a private office to have difficult conversations in if you've got an office or a home bedroom do it there do not take it to family space and when you're out and about, and this is so hard, my business is 39 years old, it's my oldest child. I'm as proud of my business today as I was the day I founded it. I think there's slightly more reason now, but perhaps not a lot. I could bore for England on the subject of what we're doing, how amazing it is, how difficult it is, how the deadlines are. I've had to learn not to do that every time I go out with my friends and family, particularly if one of the people in the group with me also works with me. People kick me now and go, shut up, you can be the boss on Monday. We have to build a life that isn't all work. Otherwise, you will find you don't have any friends and your family start to avoid you. I'm quite serious about that. You can actually lose friends and family if that's all you do. Don't forget, however, ever, ever engaging your business is, however important it is to you, to make a special space for what is important in your life that's not related to business. One of the reasons I really enjoyed the early days of my business was it coincided substantially, but not completely, with the early days of my family. I think that uh, my company was four years old when I had my first child, so I, I didn't start the company after becoming a parent as many people do but i managed to decide right well, i'm going to do all the sports days the prize givings the school plays and just put them in the diary as far ahead as i could despite the complete lack of cooperation from the school but if you can't do this i suggest you think about getting yourself some kind of business mentor now there are va coaches out there there are book web designer support groups there are all sorts of places find someone who's got their business under control time wise and stress wise by the way and find out how they do it don't go chasing the latest six-figure guru who can make you have a hundred thousand pound business by the way i'm not talking about that i'm talking about people who, who have already got a life that fits their business and find out their tips for doing it. And you'll find lots of people sharing those in the Coffee Clutch customer group from time to time. And if you've got a great one, come over and share one with us now. Because we all need upgrades. The one I need to know is how to get ready to go on holiday without working three or four straight nights before I go. Because there's always more stuff to fit in than there's time available. It's a bit like there's always a bit too much stuff to fit in a suitcase somehow. But I get a bigger suitcase, but I can't get more than 24 hours in a day. If you are getting stressed, and it is very easy to get stressed when you're growing a business, it is stressful. You've probably figured that out for yourself. And I don't want to sound like your mum, but try not to use drugs or alcohol to manage the stress. Nothing is more guaranteed to toxify family and friendships than a stress job where they work with you when you are also, you and or them, using drugs or alcohol to cope. The highs and lows of that can create some massive conflict in your life, even if the only drug you're using is mega, mega doses of coffee to keep you going. A caffeine come down can start a three generational family feud in parts of my family. Be careful. I'm not suggesting that we all take up, you know, living in an ashram and meditating, but find some way to relax. And while we're on the subject, eat healthily. Business is a marathon, not a sprint. And if you are taking your friends and family with you, you will want to be there, not just at the beginning, but in the middle and hopefully at a very distant end celebrating your successes if you totally ruin your health by living on junk food getting no sleep chain smoking and eating coffee they may be celebrating something but it will not necessarily be with you and do remember your friends and family have lives too 
they want to talk to you about their highs and lows, their, their feelings, what's going in in their life. They don't always want to talk to you about deadlines and the work in hand. And do not forget, take lots and lots of pictures, make lots of memories of your business as it's growing. It's just like a child, you know. My business is middle aged now. My business has a baby. I'm only come with my first serious business and I'm only come to Bond Coffee Clutch 10 years ago. Now my baby's getting ready to go to secondary school. Time moves on. I'm still working with one of the people I started a business with in 1980. I have learned something about making it work. If you'd like to know more about this, by the way, we've got some top tips for you. Um, check out the free download on the coffeeclatch.co.uk page, which is working with friends and family with little hyphens in the uh, spaces for you. It's absolutely free. It's packed full of tips and checklists and things to help you out. What we want is for you to have a successful business with friends and family around you, celebrating with you, not going crazy and wondering where they all went. So if you're not sure what the uh, the web page is, just think of it, working with friends and family. If you search that for Coffee Clutch, it should go up, but it's coffeeclutch.co.uk forward slash working hyphen with hyphen friends hyphen and hyphen family forward slash. <laughs>